how the hell am I supposed to follow that? Seriously, you, they invite Vivian and Tiago invite me here and they say, oh, it's going to be wonderful and all the top executives and e-commerce will be here. We'll take you to dinner. You're going to have to follow the best speaker in Brazil. Then you'll have lunch. Why, why would you do that to me? I cannot live up to that. I have no stories that take place in the toilet. I, 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 I'm not allowed to swear anymore, so no cursing. It's going to be tough. I did. My first job was in a supermarket. So uh, apparently to succeed in e-commerce, you have to love fruit. So that's, that's one thing. So uh, have fruit and you'll be okay. So, all right. I have to speak slowly. I'm from New York. Even people in New York don't understand me. So if I'm speaking too quickly, the, uh, the translate, there we go. They're already waving at me to speak slower. All right, cool. So I'm going to talk about two things today. Since I flew 5,000 miles to get here, I thought I would jam two presentations together for the price of one. Let's start with the first one. So I'm going to talk about uh, replatforming for e-commerce. Uh, we went through a replatforming exercise uh, a year and a half ago, and we learned a lot from that. And it's, uh, it's painful. Has anyone here gone through a, uh, a replatforming for e-commerce recently? Hands? Anyone? Was it delightful? Did you love it? It's the best, right? It, it's, uh, it's, it's awful. It's really terrible. And so the question on the screen, how do you know when it's time to replatform? And the answer is when you can't get any work done because it's that painful. And so we were on an old, uh, an old platform and literally it was getting to the point where people on my team every day were coming into my office and saying, I, I can't do my job anymore. And after listening to that for like a year and a half, I said, oh, you know what, it's, it's time for us to do something about that. So the first piece of advice I have is you've got to get help. I think in e-commerce, oftentimes there's a, a tension, maybe a healthy tension with your IT department. Because, uh, you, you know, I, corporate IT in the, uh, the, the technology people who have been buying, you know, big systems for 40 years have a very different approach to those of us in e-commerce who are used to moving very quickly. So a lot of times I think we're a little bit hesitant to go to IT to, for help. But I felt that this was a, a huge project. And so I went to our, our parent company. Uh, we're owned by a company that also owns Calvin Klein. And we went to them and said, uh, we need some help on this. Uh, and yeah, don't be afraid to ask. So we need some help on this. We won't be able to do it alone. And they were actually very excited by the idea of, of working on a project that was e-commerce focused and that wasn't just about stores or back-end systems like SAP, that this was sort of cutting edge for things that they, uh, for what they had done in the past. And so they were actually very excited. And for companies, for e-commerce groups that choose to do this without, uh, without going to IT first, I don't see how that can possibly succeed. And so one of the successes we saw was that once people were on board, with IT, everything in the company moved considerably more smoothly. That uh, other parts of the organization that we needed uh, to help us were always willing to help because IT was on board. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go out and you're going to find uh, a bunch of companies with e-commerce platforms and you're going to bring them in. And in English, we call that the dog and pony show. I don't know what the Portuguese translation is, where they come to your offices and uh, they show you what they can do. And the thing that's so striking is that every platform, every e-commerce platform looks amazing during the demonstration. Amazing. Because remember, the platform you're on now is terrible. You wouldn't be leaving it if it were great. So it's terrible. And so they, the people come in with a new platform that's probably six or seven years newer than what you're on, and it looks incredible. Really, every platform, no matter what it is. But then when you start to push them, you got to say, you know what? That was great uh, that you showed us this uh, grocery store, but we're in, uh, we sell clothing. Can you sell us something from clothing? Show us a, a, an example from clothing. At the same time you're doing the dog and pony show where, uh, where you're, you're meeting with the e-commerce uh, platform providers, you're going to want to start meeting with uh, development partners. It's very likely that you don't have internal resources to, uh, to implement, uh, to implement the, the software yourself, that you're going to need a third party to help you. You should start that process 
as you're doing the, uh, the meetings with the vendors. A lot of people do it afterwards, and it's thought of as an afterthought that they spend six months looking at, uh, at the software, and then in a week they decide to pick the, the, the vendor, the, the development partner. The development partner makes all of the difference. The, how the project goes depends entirely on development. And so that, that you, need to spend, you need to put aside several months to interview development partners to help you with this. It should not be an afterthought. So you have to make your development partners come in and show examples from your industry. We ran in repeatedly into issues where uh, our development partner, it turns out, had never worked on apparel. And we're asking really goofy, silly questions about where, uh, where on our product detail page we want to put the product manual. And I said, what product manual? And they said, well, no, you know, it usually uh, on the, what I've done before, you put the product manual here. And I said, it's a shirt. And they said, oh, right. And I said, the product manual is put the shirt on, take the shirt off. There's no product manual for shirts. And they said, oh, OK, no product manual. And it sounds really silly, but there were, for, there were 20 examples of that where I'd have to say, it's clothing. There, we don't need whatever it is you're doing. Make sure your development partner has implemented your industry before so you can cut out sort of these silly conversations. Interview individual people on the development partner team. Don't just pick a development partner. Interview and meet specific people for the roles as if you're hiring them for yourself. You're gonna find that there's, there's going to be weak links in there. So you need to hire for all the key positions. Don't listen to the initial time estimates. They're gonna come in and they're gonna say, oh, we can do this in, in, uh, in two months, or we can do this in six weeks, or whatever. We were on a very tight time frame, and they said, oh, Four months, absolutely. That is, that's not a problem at all. It's nonsense. You can always get something, that, you can always get it done in four months by taking stuff out. And what I found is it takes nine to 12 months to do this project correctly. No matter how you cut it, so we put it in live in four months and then spent the next six months putting it together the way it should have been done in the first place. It can always go live and so when you're, you know, your bosses are going to say to you, how quickly can we get this fixed? How quickly can we get this done? And you'll go to development partner and they'll say, oh, four months, no problem. And they'll, you'll get pushed for four months and, you know, three weeks into it, they're going to say, well, to get this done in four months, we can't do this, 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 this. this. Don't listen to it. F determine what you need and have them tell you how long that will take, not how long it will just take to get live. The development partner is only as good as their weakest link. And it's gonna become apparent really quickly who that weak link was. And after about two weeks, we had, uh, we had a business analyst on their team who was clearly not as strong as the rest of the team. And we were kind of debating what to do. And our company is very touchy-feely about people and you want everyone to succeed and love what they're doing. But this is a development partner and you need to cut that out Immediately. If somebody isn't working and you have a four month time frame, you can't lose three weeks thinking about how you can help them develop their skills. You, you need to go to them and say, we need to switch these people and we need to do it today. So they're going to come to you and they're going to show you this reference store. And it's going to be a, uh, basically, they take the software and they turn it on or whatever. I'm not a technical guy. They, 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 they load it up and they'll show you this store that basically is the framework for a store. And in our case, uh, they showed us a store that was a fruit, it was a fruit seller. So it was fruit. And, uh, oh, there we go. So it was fruit and they would bring in my merchants, the people who buy the clothes, and they would need some help with, uh, with, uh, with what needs to be built, with requirements. And they would say, okay, I, we need to show you this page and I have some questions about it. And they would say, well, well, I don't understand. And they'd say, well, where the strawberries are, that's going to be a sweater. So imagine the strawberries are a sweater. And imagine where it says, uh, you know, three kilos of strawberries. Imagine that says uh, extra large. And it's, it's hard to work that way because everything is being translated from fruit into sweaters. You need to get them to show you it to start from the place, from your industry. There is, if you're not looking at the base store from your industry, you're gonna waste a lot of time undoing weights or, or whatever it is, undoing things that don't apply to your industry. Start from a place in your industry. You'll save a lot of time. 
when they're showing you in the demo and when they're showing you the, the initial store, you need to ask a lot of questions about things that you don't want in there. And it will seem like that's a, it's kind of a silly thing to think about, but taking things out takes a lot of time. And so they, there were a number of features in there that I never fully understood. One was called a coupon wallet that I never understood what it did, and I kept saying, can we just take that out? And they would come back and say, well, taking that out is, uh, is two weeks. And I would say, no, I, I don't want it. And they'd say, yes, if you don't want it, that's two weeks. And so there's a lot of this stuff you'll hear about out of the box, meaning you know what comes with the program and uh, with the software, and out of the box is nonsense. You're gonna start to dread the, uh, this hearing things are out of the box. Because it, what it generally means is that changing it in any way is difficult and time consuming and costly. It means that you can't do things that, uh, that you otherwise would have wanted to do. Changing things that are out of the box also is difficult. So if something is built a certain way, even if it seems like there's something that's obvious, in our case, there was uh, the way checkout worked, billing came first and then shipping. I don't know here, but at least in the US, generally shipping comes first and then billing. And it was a four week project to flip it. And I kept saying, but every website in the world does it the other way. They said, yeah, we know, but this is out of the box. So I forbade, I, I no longer allowed anyone to talk about out of the box because typically your software provider or your developer will talk about out of the box like a positive thing as if it's not something that you'll have to build yourself. But in a lot of cases, it's exactly the opposite of that. It means you're going to have to build it differently and taking it out and then building it the way you want it is actually harder than building something from scratch. So you've got to pay attention to what's already there and ask a lot of questions about how tied, how tied into the whole piece of software is this thing. Because you also have no idea how, how the guts of it work. And I can't tell you how many times I was shocked by how, tie, how things in, in, in the software were tied together that you wouldn't expect. So there was one time where we wanted to change how filtering worked or sorting worked, and they said, well, if we change that, it will break the footer. Why would sorting break the footer? It just will. And so you, I think I say this on a later slide, you have no idea what's easy and what's hard. Things that seem very, very easy will take a month. Things that seem wildly complex, they'll say, oh no, that's, that's a, days of work, uh, a day of work. So you have to, you really need to spend a lot of time with development around requirements and around exactly what you want. And so when you see features in the demo, you got to ask, how hard is it to take it out, how long will it take, and how many resources will be devoted to it? Oh, and I had mentioned, the, if something's industry standard, how you expect it to work, doesn't mean that's how it's going to work. You really need to ask very specific questions. Nothing, <laughs> nothing is as you would expect. You have to have them show you every single thing and spend days going through every piece of functionality. Because if you don't see it the way you expect it, it doesn't work that way. There are two team members in this project who you really care about, and me as the, uh, the head of e-commerce is not one of them. The first one is your project manager on your side. I relied every single day, several times a day, on my project manager. He was able to ask and answer, he was able to answer tons of questions from the development partner without having to escalate them to me. And if you didn't have that, you were going to be bothered with a million little questions. You need to find someone you trust who understands your business, who can go through and that you trust to handle 95% of the things. Because they, they need to be able to determine when am I going to escalate something and what can I handle myself. And you may want to bring in somebody and go find someone who's been a great project manager someplace else, bring them in for a year to handle this. This is a huge project that's very complicated with a lot of parts. And if this person isn't good, you will lose control. And if this person isn't good, the business analyst on the developer side. The business analyst translates what your merchants and your marketing people want into uh, developer speak. If they don't understand what your business is and how your business works and why people would be asking what they're asking for, they're going to literally write down what was told to them and your developers will literally do that and it will be wrong and lost in translation. They need to understand how your business works and why people are asking for things the way they're asking for them. Because you will run into a host of problems 
if this was wrong. And I had mentioned that we had to let somebody go from the developer side early, and it was all around this. They were not able to understand what the business needs were and translate that. They were able to write down everything, but they were, they were missing the bigger point. So the business users, the people on your team actually using the tool are going to be a source of frustration for you and they're going to be frustrated with you as the e-commerce person. They have, you know, they've been coming to you for a year and a half begging for a new platform and when they get this, uh, they're going to want a huge list of new things, right? Because they think, wow, this is several million dollars, it's going to take a year of my time, I'm going to get, I want everything. I want everything. And so you're going to start and they're going to give you this massive list of functionality. And you and your project manager and the business analysts need to sit there and start to ask, why do you need this? Why do you need this? Is there a better way we can handle what you're asking for? Because rightfully so, they're going to want a lot of things. That requirements process of finding out what they want takes a lot longer than you think. That is not three, meet three one hour meetings. That is a long time and you need to tell them up front, listen, I'm going to need your help for six weeks. You're going to be in a lot of meetings. If this means that I need to hire, you need to hire a temp to do some of your work, tell me and I'll bundle that into the cost of the project. But this isn't a small amount of your time. Your business users will be very, very involved. And it can be a good thing because you're pitching it as, oh, you know, you're going to be able to do your job better. But it, you need to tell them up front and be very realistic about how long and how much work it's going to take. So for release one, for when you turn the thing live, you're going to go through, you know, halfway through it, you're going to, halfway through the project, you're going to realize you need to make some choices. And you're going to need to make choices about whether you're going to make improvements that will be customer facing, that things that your, your customers who visit the site will see, or you need to make choices for things that will be better on the back end so that your business users will have improvements. You're gonna to need to make a trade-off, and I think you absolutely, absolutely side with your business users for that first release. If they don't feel like they've gotten more after a year and all of that time they put in and the cost, if they feel like they're, they have less than they did before, you will lose them. They will literally quit over this kind of thing. It's frustrating, this is a hard project. They need to feel a win initially and they need to be excited about using the tool and learning more about it and exploiting all of the, uh, the functionality in it. You need to give them wins. And I know it's hard to say, well, the customer comes second, but in this case, you, you need to have the business users on your side and then the customers will win from that. So who makes decisions? with this. There's a, everyone in your company is going to want to be involved. You know, you've got IT involved, so your head of IT is involved. My boss will be involved. Marketing is all excited about the, the new tool. The merchandising team is all, ex everyone is excited about this and everyone will have input. One person needs to be appointed the decision maker. One. And in a lot of companies, mine included, where everyone's input is really valued, that's a hard thing to do culturally, to say there is one person who answers for this, one person who makes final decisions, because there are a lot of decisions along the way about trade-offs, about launch date, about pushing the launch date off, about when it's okay to push the launch date off, about working weekends and working nights and getting over, there's a million, there are a million decisions one person. And then when you uh, appoint that person on the first day, you tell the developers you don't listen to anybody else, it all goes through this person. And then you call everyone together and you say on the kickoff meeting, this person, it happened to be me in our case, but it can be whoever, this person is ultimately responsible. You don't go to other people to complain, you complain to this person. Uh, so, this project will actually finish someday. It will be hard to believe, but you will, you will be, get close to finishing. And so here are some things about, uh, that you're gonna wanna, going to want to do uh, when you go live. So you're going to have a list of things that need to get fixed. And that list is going to say, uh, go from showstoppers, things that have to be fixed or you can't go live, to things that are marked low level that will be small things that need to be changed. The problem is if you, if you keep that uh, that scale going, no one will ever fix low level. Low level will always get pushed to the next release, always. And so we changed it, the scale to uh, must fix, things that had to be fixed before you go live, to should fix. And then we went through the should fix list and we went through all of the low level defects, the should fix list, for things that were customer facing. 
Because when you do this, you're going to see a ton of little things where something is misaligned and something else is overlapping and something isn't quite where it should be. And no single one of those is a problem, but when you look at it as a whole, the site doesn't look professionally completed. It really looks ragged. And so any one of those had been marked low level, you would never have done them. They would just always get pushed off, which is why we called it should fix. And we said, okay, let's put all of these uh, customer facing low level defects into should fix and they need to be fixed before launch. So they're not showstoppers, but it, if, if someone came to your site after, they were li after it's live and these weren't fixed, you'd be embarrassed. You then need to decide what defects you can live with because you're going to have a list. And I mean, we launched about a year and a half ago and there's still a handful of silly things from that initial list that were never completed. Generally, uh, after you go live, you will have a, uh, you'll have developers who are doing maintenance on the site. And that group that implemented the site will no longer be with you, they'll transition off. And so for some of these defects, you're gonna need to decide which of these defects are the responsibility of your development partner in which one goes uh, are the responsibility of the, the group that will continue your development. And that seems like kind of a small point, but it was actually a huge one. Because there were, there were things that were broken where we would hand them off to our new uh, developer and they would say, well, that will be $25,000. And we'd say, well, that, no, it was broken. And they'd say, well, go back to the other people and tell them to fix it. And we had a lot of, well, don't tell me to fix it, tell the other people to fix it. So you need to determine very quickly, as you're going live, you to talk to your development partner and say, okay, these things we agree are not fixed, right? These are, we'll go back to the original contract. These things aren't fixed, you will fix them. And these other things, we're gonna move along. You're gonna, we spent an enormous amount of time on this, and I never saw it coming, ever. That we spent a lot of arguing about who's gonna fix what. Once you turn it on, uh, once you go to stage before you go live, the, you had exported your catalog, you had taken your old catalog, and you were going to put it into the new live site. Not everything is gonna show up. I don't know why that is, but things are missing. And everyone I've ever talked to about this says the same thing. Products that were on the old live site suddenly are no longer on the new site. You should get an intern or get a couple of temps to go through your current site and, uh, and go through the, the new stage site to find out where the products are missing because they're going to be missing. And I think this is probably the most important thing. You gotta tell your boss, when you turn this on, there's gonna be some things wrong and they're going to break. I don't know what those things are because he's gonna say, well, didn't you test it? Yes, I tested the things I knew about and the things that will break are the things you don't know about. They're the things you didn't think to test or know would test. And here's the silliest example with, with WebSphere. If you turned on content on the site in a on the 31st of May, and the next month, June, has 30 days, it breaks. I don't know, how, there's no way to know that, and IBM said, well, yes, that's a defect we know about, and we said, that's a really ridiculous defect that if you turn on content live on the 31st day of the month, and the next month does not have 31 days, the site will break. It's that type of silly stuff that you will not foresee. So that's why you tell your boss, boss, things are going to happen that you won't be happy with. I don't know what those things are, but just bear with us, we'll fix them. He wasn't happy with that either, but when things broke, I went back to him and I said, remember, I told you, things are going to break, I didn't know what they would be, and then it broke. See, I was right. So some random things. Uh, you have to fire your old platform provider, but you have to be nice to them too, because you need a lot of help from them getting functionality, getting exports from that data, from uh, getting the catalog export, all stuff out of the old system to make the new system work. And that's gonna be hard because you really hate them. I mean, you, you undertook this project because you really didn't like these people. And it, you, you're, I was uh, so tempted to just say, screw you, we're out, and just hang up the phone and run away and giggle. But you can't, you have to say, well, we made a very difficult decision and you know, it came down to you and this other people, and you've been such a good partner, but we just felt it's time to move on. It's not, it's not you, it's us. And you have this lovely conversation, and you send them chocolates. It, it's, it, was, it was really beautiful. Uh, we, all, we, had a, we had a good cry together. So you're gonna need them, their help, so you, you have to be very professional during the breakup. And 
you know, we had, especially at the end, we had a, a rough time with our old platform provider because it wasn't going well. But they were, I will say this, they were amazing during the transition. They were incredibly professional, were really responsive, very, very helpful. And then at the end, I thought, oh, we should have hired them again. They were so great. Uh, let's see. Oh, here, here, this is a big one. You're going, to you're going to fall behind schedule. And you're going to have a meeting. And the developers are going to say, we are four weeks behind schedule. And then you have to decide, do we push out four weeks? Or do we... Uh, or do we take out functionality? And you're gonna say, oh, okay, you know what? Let's just take out this part. Don't, don't do whatever, don't do this thing, don't put in uh, PayPal, whatever. Don't do that. And they'll say, oh, okay, no problem. It will take three weeks to take that out. What? It takes time not to do something? Yes, uh, it's gonna take us two weeks to write up the requirements for removing it, and a week to actually develop that. So when you fall behind schedule, you have to start that discussion early to say, okay, what are we not going to do? How long is it going to take not to do that? If we take that out, are there other things that touch it that it will affect? Because they're everything, the, these, we're on WebSphere, IBM WebSphere, and it's enormously complicated. And everything seems to touch everything else. And so when you make a small decision, it has a lot of consequences that aren't apparent. And so you need to go to your developer and say, look, Go back, take a day or two, tell me what will happen if I take this out. And so I was originally so frustrated with these conversations about, oh, it's gonna take a week or a month not to do these things. You just have to get in front of problems early and build that into the schedule and say, okay, taking this out is gonna save us three weeks, but it's gonna take some extra time. Dealing with all of your vendors who are implemented into your site or touch your site even your current vendors, takes a long time. Dealing with Omniture took forever. We use a company called Sertona that for, uh, for recommendations forever. It took a really, really long time. And so you have to build that into the schedule that you know that you're gonna want, you have Omniture now, you're gonna want Omniture in the new site. That's gonna take some time, and unfortunately, if Omniture doesn't have anyone available, that messes up your project. There, you had your time frame in there, but they don't have anyone, sorry. And you're gonna have a bunch of those because you have a whole lot of tools that are touching your site. And I would design with mobile in mind. Uh, when I first did this presentation, I think this was less obvious. I think it's more obvious now. We built, uh, we built our platform and then as soon as it went live, we rebuilt it uh, for responsive. So we, didn't, we don't run a separate mobile site. Our site uh, renders differently, shows up differently on your mobile phone and on tablet. I would absolutely recommend that. Uh, we can talk about that afterwards. But I would, have, I would have done that at the beginning of the project rather than having to take a couple of months afterwards to sort of rebuild a lot of what we did. You may say to yourself, oh, you know what? To save time, we're not going to do a redesign at the same time that we're, uh, that we're doing this, uh, this big e-commerce implementation. But the, the reality of the matter is you're going to have to do some redesigning. That your site, the way it's designed, cannot, in most cases, will not, exact, will not work exactly that way on the new platform. So it's not a huge redesign, but buttons will have to be moved slightly where your, the breadcrumbs at the top of the page will probably be different. There are just a lot of very small redesign issues. And so even if you're not doing a redesign, you're going to need design help. Uh, we used a tag management solution, putting in uh, new, uh, new tags, new pixels on our old system was miserable. Uh, so we went with a, we use a company called Telium. There are a bunch out there that are fine. Uh, I would absolutely recommend that. And this is, a, if you don't use a tag management tool, when you switch to a new commerce platform, it's a great time to put one in, to develop it uh, at the same time. So your biggest risks, and talking about risks uh, with your boss can be scary, especially if they're not uh, a technical person. Because this to them, I think this felt like when I'd have this conversation about risks with my boss, it felt like I was disappointing him. Like, uh, if I knew what I was doing, we wouldn't have any risks. But there are risks in any large software project. And anyone who does software work knows that. There's always project risks. You need to translate that for your boss to say, look, there are things that may go wrong. This is very complicated. 
And so some of the biggest risks are that catalog extraction, taking things out of your catalog, putting it into your new site. Things went wrong there. Things broke. The initial extraction was broken. It, that's, it's hard, and because you're taking it out of one system and into another, it's tricky. The integration with your company's other systems, so you may have a accounting software on the back end or a big ERP system, that's complicated and that's risky. And the people, uh, even your integrator has never integrated with your exact systems. That's risky. The product database I talked about in your integration with your distribution center is another one that is really tricky. We use a third party uh, for our distribution and the they required a lot of time and effort to connect WebSphere with them because they didn't have any WebSphere clients. So they, it was, everything was done from scratch. So we got them involved day one. They were involved uh, right after we picked WebSphere. We brought our, uh, our warehouse people, our distribution center people, that technical team in, and they were there from day one. And essentially that project with our distribution center W went in parallel for the entire length of the project. That's a huge, huge project. Distribution center is, is crazy. And so none of these things are platform specific. They're, all of these, no matter what platform you're going to and going, going from and then going to, those will be big risks for you. So that's the end of part one. That's, uh, that's uh, e-commerce platforms. So I thought I'd also talk about uh, A-B testing. So I'm going to give some examples of uh, some A-B testing that we've been doing lately uh, and then give you a list of other things to do. And I'll mention this again at the end. A-B testing, I think, is actually a cultural thing. That if you can make uh, testing part of the culture of your organization, you will do great with it. If it is not part of the culture of your organization, it will be a struggle. And so we worked, we got a tool called Monetate. There are a bunch of other tools out there. We use Monetate that allows you to do content testing on your site very easily and without, uh, without any effort from your technical people. Most, uh, most e-commerce platforms today uh, allow you to do uh, content testing through that. You can do it that way. It's a little more complicated. Google has a, uh, a testing platform. If you have a pretty simple platform, that works nicely. Anyway, we use Monetate. I'm happy to talk to you about uh, what we like about them. But when we brought them in, uh, we spent a lot of money and it sat there and it didn't do anything. We didn't use it and it was driving me nuts because I were writing a check to them every month and I keep thinking we're not using this for anything. And finally, I brought in, uh, I brought our team together and we brainstormed like 50 things we wanted to test and then we just started knocking them off. And once you start to see successes and you see real revenue coming in the door from these tests, you want to do more and more of it. And now the team is so excited that every time we do anything new, we come up with what's the test? What are we testing this against? And it becomes oddly sort of fun. So here are a few things that we did, take or leave them. So uh, up in the upper right there, it's uh, on top, it says two day delivery at no extra charge when you select ground shipping. So what we did was uh, we, went, we worked with our distribution center to say, give me a list of all of the zip codes uh, you can, that if you shipped by ground, it would arrive in two days. So give me all of the zip codes where ground shipping arrives in two days. And then we, uh, we loaded all of those zip codes into, uh, into Monetate so that it would only display that two-day shipping promotion to people who were, within, who were located where they would get the product in two days. And so we saw a site conversion rate increase uh, by uh, almost 15%, an increase in average order value by about 20%, and we reduced card abandonment for people who saw this messaging. So it was, this was one of the early ones we did, and it was enormously successful right away. We were thrilled with it. We launched an outlet store on the site. And on the bottom, uh, where we just put the, uh, over on the right-hand side, where it says company store outlet, was how we originally built it. And on the top, where we kind of have these two tabs, was what we were testing against. And the tabbed experience worked better, and it increased the site conversion by about 6%, decreased card abandonment, increased the time on the site, and so we were able to see, oh, because there was debate internally about how we wanted to show the outlet site. Should we show it in that main navigation or should we force people into sort of tabs on the site? And we no longer had the argument once we saw, you know what, it works. This free shipping. We tested uh, a one-day promotion for free shipping. We put it in the, uh, 
in the promo area up top there, and we saw 7% increase in site conversion, increase in uh, add to carts, increase in page views versus not putting it there. Again, these are simple tests that were easy to do and monetate to show, you know what, is free shipping more valuable? Because it used to, <laughs> I'm not a, I, I have issues with free shipping. It's very expensive for us. I've never been particularly convinced that it works, that it increases conversion. And so my team came up with this so I would stop complaining about it. And they said, look, we had a 7% increase in site conversion. And you can back into how much more money that, how much more revenue that is, how much more profit. And you found for us, it paid for itself. And you can, have, you can end these disagreements that you have just by testing. Here's one we did for uh, abandoned cart. So if you had something in your cart and you, uh, and you came back and there's still something in your cart, we tried two different, uh, two different uh, messaging, there's two different ways of mes messaging that because we couldn't decide which one we liked better. Here's one, uh, we have an overlay, like a pop-up when you come to the site uh, for email sign-up. One asked for uh, just your email address, one asked for uh, your birthday and uh, zip code. Uh, it was interesting. The birthday, the one with the more fields uh, converted better, but the one up top actually gave us more, uh, I'm sorry, people who filled in the bottom one actually converted better on the site. They bought more. But, people who filled, but more people filled in the top one. And so we had to decide, what is the point of this? And the point is to get more email conversions. And so we went with the, uh, the top shorter form and we gave up the, uh, the idea of getting someone's zip code and birthday. When we launched the outlet site, uh, we had a disagreement about whether we should have just a plain announcement in text or whether we should also show product. Uh, we showed product, that worked, we showed both. Uh, showing product, turns out, worked better for us. So here are a bunch of other things you can test. Uh, you'll find on your site, if you go through it, you probably have buttons that aren't necessary. You might want to test uh, moving them to hyperlinks. You can test font sizes on your product name. Should the font um, uh, size of the price be larger or should it be smaller? I don't know. You should test those. The size of your buttons, uh, we've been playing with testing button size and button colors. Uh, that's been really successful. We, uh, we moved our, uh, our checkout button from being blue to being red. Increased conversion day one. Something so simple to do. Uh, you can test button colors that are different than your set of colors on the site. We use a lot of red, white, and blue. And so we tested uh, yellow, green. Are, are there other colors that would work better because those would stand out more? On a field that you have to fill in, like when you're checking out, that's mandatory. Usually we've been using an asterisk. You could use, what if you highlighted that field? Would that work better? And then testing things on mobile, how things display on mobile. Should you be removing content from the site? because uh, it, it renders too slowly on mobile. So we've tested taking things out of the mobile site and how that helps things convert. So that's, that's kind of a list of things you can, you can take home and do whatever you want with. Uh, but I think here are the, the most important takeaways about, uh, about A-B testing. Like I said in the beginning, this really is about getting everyone on board. More importantly than your direct team, uh, in our case, we use, uh, we use our marketing team, their designers, to design for us. And I think designers tend to believe that uh, when they design something, it's the best design there is. But you need to go, and I, I think at first they're a little offended when you say, well, can you show me a different example of that? And oftentimes we would hear, no, this was the best, this was the best version of whatever it was. You're gonna need a lot more assets from them. And you need to convince them that this isn't about, oh, this one is good or this one is bad. It's that, it's about figuring out what customers respond to. And I think if you present it to them as an interesting challenge, what are the two best ways you can present this information? They get on board with it. But that's, I think that's one of the hardest discussions you have because designers are not used to working that way. They're used to coming up with the best thing, most creative thing they can. But this isn't necessarily about this. It's about figuring out what do customers respond to and testing it. So you can also do contests on your, on your team just to guess, okay, of these tests, which one's gonna do better? And you can do, do goofy things, you know, take them to lunch or whatever it is. We've, you know, we've given gift cards for the site just to get people excited about this. They should want the site to do better. And there are, it's much easier to do 100 little things a little bit better than it is there's, to find some sort of magic thing that will double your conversion. There is no magic thing, but there are 100 tiny little things. And once you start getting involved in this, in A-B testing, you'll see, you'll come up with 100 no problem that you can test and then you just 
bang them out, one after the other. And the tools are so easy to use nowadays to do the testing, you're going to do you're going to want to do so much of it. I'm telling you, once you start, it will be, it'll be fantastic. Oh, and the bottom one, use some sort of shared document so everyone knows what's being tested. Because I'll go through checkout and I'll see something I've never seen before, and then I bother my, my site producer, like, what is that doing there? And she'll say, didn't you look? I send out this note every week about what we're testing. We're testing it. So use a shared document that everyone can see. Have your site producer send out a, an email every week with what's being tested, what, what was being tested last week, what the results were, uh, because everyone needs to know what's going on. And then you'll be surprised that you know, my, my merchandise planners have come to us with ideas. Everyone wants to get in on it. So it's a, uh, it's a fun project. With that, that's how you can reach me. I'd love to hear questions. Thanks.